Hello all. So this is the beginning of week two, and this week we'll be covering Descartes. So there's both the primary text and the secondary text. Today is day one, so we'll be dealing with the primary text of what Descartes wrote himself, and that is Meditation 1. So in this meditation, he provides some reasons for radical skepticism. So he thinks at the end of day at the end of the day we should doubt everything. And the reason why is so that we can tear everything down, all the things that we believe to be true, so that we may rebuild and provide a certain foundation for all of our knowledge. So if you were to characterize this this is a project in epistemology, right? So this is a matter of knowledge and knowing. What we think we know, what we're justified in believing. These sorts of questions are the primary concern of Descartes in the meditations. So towards this end, the first thing that he does in meditation one is tear down everything we think we can know. And then after that, he'll rebuild. But first we'll get more into the details of this project. So. I think it's useful to have some autobiographical or biographical understanding of the people you're learning about. Maybe it helps people remember. It helps me remember things about them. And it also helps to make sense of why they wrote what they wrote and why they seem to believe certain sorts of things. So I'll provide a brief biography here and then we'll actually get into meditation one. So Descartes, the person. So he was around during the early modern period. Sometimes this is referred to as the Enlightenment. So Descartes in particular was around at the beginning of the Enlightenment. As you can see, he died in 1650, right? So he was alive pretty much through the 17th century. Um, he's sometimes called the father of early modern philosophy. And this is largely because he changed the main issues. So. Before, there was much more focus on what is real and sort of more metaphysical questions. And while Descartes still has interest in those sorts of issues, he is much more interested in epistemology, right? So I already kind of said this, but that's the study of knowledge and knowing, and that's what the meditations are primarily about. So this new focus, in part, can be thought of as a result of Descartes' education. So Descartes was raised a Jesuit, and he was given all sorts of uh, prescriptions, the dogma as they call it, but not in a pejorative sense, just what the canon says. And he grew up taking this stuff to heart, and in his later years, in later parts of the meditations even, he defends things like the existence of God, um, and the distinction between the body and the mind, so kind of an argument for why we'd have like an immaterial soul or mind. But he also came to question some of the things that he was taught. And it was this sort of questioning of received knowledge from the scholastic tradition of Aquinas and Augustine that led him to his epistemic concerns, his worries about knowledge and knowing. Besides dealing in philosophy, he also he was a bit of a polymath. So if you've ever heard of Cartesian coordinates, he worked heavily in geometry, and that's you have Descartes to thank for that idea. He also worked in optics. He did a lot of um, dissection and vivisection. He was big into trying to figure out where consciousness comes from and that sort of thing. Um, so another thing that characterizes Descartes is that he is a rationalist. So this means that he emphasizes reason over the senses. So if there's any way for us to know something, it's by reason. And for Descartes, the senses are an unreliable method and they're not to be trusted. So that's also characteristic of him kind of being the first person to uh, propound this method in, in a very systematic way. So. And an interesting little anecdote about him that's also telling in terms of his philosophy is he was worked to death. So the story goes that he was a 
successful philosopher and became renowned for his work. And he was invited to be the tutor of the Queen of Sweden. So he went to Sweden and had to get up very early every morning because the Queen had a busy schedule and she wanted to be tutored first thing so she could go about her day. So Descartes had to wake up first thing in the morning and walk across this cold courtyard and give lessons. But the thing about Descartes is that he was a sickly boy and a sickly man as he got older. So he was allowed in his earlier life during his Jesuit education to stay in bed till noon and he would just sort of sit around and, and write and think and fall back asleep and do this sort of routine. Um, and that was partially due to his health. So when he was forced to have a more rigorous early morning routine, he died. <laughs> so hard work can kill, apparently, at least in his case. Um, and one of the reasons why this is interesting is because he spent a lot of time going in and out of uh, sleep and sort of loafing around, this sort of thing. So you could see how he would come to formulate some of the arguments that we'll see in a moment. Um, he probably, you know, if you ever take a short nap and wake back up, you might yourself be confused as to whether or not, you know, this is actually a waking moment or, or if you're still in a dream. And so that was probably the case with him as well, which explains some of his arguments. So we'll get into that in more detail in a moment. So this is my beautiful graphic of meditation one in a nutshell. So I'll post this, but it's just a good overview to keep track of what in general happens. And you can fill in little pieces if it's helpful to do so. So on the y-axis here you have what Descartes claims to know. So what are things that we think we can know in terms of some sort of measurement of quantity, like the number of beliefs that you, you know, claim that you can know. And then there's the meditations in order. So starting with meditation one and meditation two. So you can see this precipitous decline in what Descartes thinks you can know as meditation one proceeds. So that's the tearing down phase that we'll be investigating more closely in a minute. And so towards that, he provides three main arguments. The part of prudence, the dream argument, and the evil demon argument. And each is in, of increasing sort of force in order to convince you that radical skepticism is the best alternative, that we can't claim to know anything. And then after he's torn knowledge, what we think we know all the way down, he tries to rebuild. So, starting now. So, one might wonder why Descartes had this motivation to start afresh, to tear down everything we think we know. And I think this very early statement gives a good sense of his motivations for doing so. So, in section one, um, which corresponds to the sections in the online reading that I posted, he says, I first came. I first became aware that I had accepted, even from my youth, many false opinions were true, and that consequently what I afterward based on such principles was highly doubtful. And from that time I was convinced of the necessity of undertaking once in my life to rid myself of all the opinions I had adopted, and of commencing anew the work of building from the foundation, if I desired to establish an, ab an abiding superstructure in the, in the sciences. that should be anabiting, but I'm pretty sure I copied and pasted this, so I'm surprised there's a typo. In any case, so the idea is here is that so any number of our beliefs at this moment are mistaken. It's based on the number of beliefs that we all have, it's very unlikely that we don't at least have some mistaken beliefs. Um, just the state of science is imperfect. Some of our best scientific theories might be totally false also. And I'm sure a whole other range of beliefs we have about, you know, daily living and others and all sorts of things. So, with that in mind, Descartes thinks, well, how am I going to be sure that any given particular belief is going to be correct? And 
this is sort of a systematic problem. Because on the whole, we can think, well, yeah, most of our beliefs are probably right. But how do we know each one is right? And it seems like there's no good way for establishing that every single belief is correct, especially if we have general problems with the methods by which we come to believe things. So one of the main methods, for example, is the senses, and the senses sometimes lead us astray. So because this problem emerges, he wants to build a foundation from the ground up and create an abiding superstructure in the sciences. So this just sort of means a secure foundation for knowledge. Um, you could just substitute one for the other. He doesn't mean something specifically like the empirical sciences. He means human knowledge in general. Um, yeah. So towards this end of starting over, he begins bulldozing our belief, your beliefs, our beliefs, his beliefs. Um, and he does this by saying, it will be sufficient to justify the rejection of the whole of my knowledge if I shall find in each some ground for doubt. So we can reject everything we believe if the principles by which we gain that knowledge is at all suspect. So there's two primary means by which we gain knowledge. And these are the senses, right? We think we know lots of facts about the world because of the senses, and reason. And we think we know lots of conceptual or mathematical facts, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, or a bachelor is an unmarried man. We think these are matters of reason. So if he can find flaws in these sort of principles by which we gather all other particular pieces of knowledge, then we have reason to doubt the whole. So, towards the end of doubting our general principles of knowledge, he first argues against the senses. And so, this part of Pruden's argument is against the senses. It begins in section 3, and I nicely laid out the argument in premise and conclusion form. So, if something has misled you before, you should not trust it. The senses have misled before, so you should not trust the senses. So let's apply our skills and analyze this argument a little bit more closely and see if we can't come up with something um, interesting. So this first sort of premise here seems a little bit questionable. You might wonder to yourself, this seems like a pretty strict rule, right? If something has ever misled you before, you should not trust it. You might think that this is some sort of easy generalization. Right, so some sort of piece of fallacious reasoning that you're now familiar with, um, because you know, after all, my senses have certainly deceived me before, but I would say that's a very low percentage. Probably not one percent of my beliefs formed from the senses were shown to be in error. So it seems like taking from a very few small cases and generalizing to a huge range of cases might be illegitimate. Um, what can Descartes say in terms of response to this? I would say keep in mind that the project is certainty. So this generalization isn't illegitimate insofar as he's trying to find a way to know with 100% indubitability that everything we know is true. And if you can't meet that, very high golden standard, then you can doubt it. So for the purposes of establishing a perfectly solid foundation on which to base all of our future beliefs, it seems like it's justifiable to say certainty is required and that this is not a hasty generalization after all. You might object and say, well, we're never going to get a certain foundation, um, and this is just an ill-fated project or something like that, but that's a more general objection, I think. Um, and then if we continue on, you'll see the senses have misled before, true or false, I already had it written up there, and I think this is probably true. I think most of us have had some sort of experience in which we were somewhat confused 
about information we gathered from the senses, and we formed a belief that was false as a result. So that's not terribly controversial. Um, and then so the last thing to do would be to analyze keep doing that would be to analyze the structure of the argument. So this is just a very simple if p then q, p therefore q right. If something has misled before, you should not trust it. The senses have misled before, therefore you should not trust them. Um, so that's valid. So it seems like overall this is a good argument. You might want to object to some of these principles, and I gave you some tools to consider objections. Um, but that's a general outline. So this is just the first of three arguments to lead us to skepticism, to tear down all of our beliefs. So one of the responses that Descartes considers is that um, it seems like you might say that some things are not doubtable. And he asks, how can I reasonably doubt that I have hands? You know, if you're the sort of person that seriously is like, oh my god, my hands are missing, um, you're probably crazy, right? That just seems like it's something very hard to genuinely doubt. Um, and so he gives some colorful examples of people naked in a psych ward thinking they're royalty. And if you seriously doubt whether or not, you know, some very basic facts about yourself, you might be warranted to go to such a place. I think he's joking. So that's kind of his rebuttal. Um, so you might say, yeah, I mean, I guess that is probably a pretty high standard, this sort of certainty thing. I'm not really in a position to doubt whether or not I have hands or you know some other sort of fact like that. So I don't like this part of prudence argument. Or you might think it's not sound, is what I mean by not like. So because of this, Descartes provides additional arguments. And one of these arguments is the dream argument. So part of prudence argument does some work towards us doubting the senses, but it doesn't get the job done. We still might think that, you know, I'm kind of confused, but I still have some basic beliefs that I can hold on to like that I have a body or something like that. So the dream argument does more work. And again, I've laid it out pretty clearly, hopefully. Um, so in section five, he lays out the idea that, so first of all, any, at any given moment, um, the representation, representations from the senses uh, could occur while I was awake or dreaming. So it seems like we could be sensing some experience just as well whether or not we're awake or asleep. Um, and this seems to imply that there's no clear way to discern whether or not we're awake or asleep. Um, if there's no clear way to discern whether we're dreaming or awake, you shouldn't trust the senses. So therefore, you shouldn't trust the senses. So, again, you might think, well, so the initial point was, you know, I can be confident that I have hands because, look, I can see them right now. Like, how could I seriously doubt this? And then the second round of rebuttals that Descartes offers just sort of suggests, well, look, while you're looking at your hand right now, you could be asleep. You know, some of us may have had dreams in which you look right in front of you and you see flippers or something. I don't know, I've never had that dream. But in principle, that seems perfectly conceivable, right? So why not just think that at any given moment you're just perpetually confused? Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are skeptical, and why might you be skeptical? Well, partially that's up for you to decide, um, and hopefully you can provide reasons, otherwise it seems like you might be rationally compelled to accept this argument. But I think one way that you might be able to discern um, between waking and sleeping is, for example, continuity, right? So I guess this comes up in Inception, for those of you that have seen that movie. So if you can't recall where you came from, you might think this is a dream, right? So dreams kind of have this characteristic where they're sporadic moment to moment and you just kind of arrive at places and there's no backstory whereas if we sit here 
and reflect. I can think about my monotonous day that I had, um, and it doesn't seem much like a dream. I don't have eight-hour dreams in which I work at a computer all day. So this might be a discerning feature that allows you to tell whether or not you're awake or asleep. So you might think that 1B is false. But I think Descartes can strengthen this by saying something like, so moment to moment, consider at any given moment, for the next five seconds, do you have within your frame of reference just your visual experience by itself, or all of your sensory experience? Do you have any means of saying for sure whether or not this is a dream or if you're actually awake? It seems like in any given moment you don't have the resources to do that. It's only upon sort of reflecting that we can do that. So it still seems like we have some room to doubt. And even the point is, is that even if it's not a great deal of room to doubt, as long as we have some, we aren't certain. And if we aren't certain, then it can't be a foundation for our knowledge, right? Because that's the whole goal, is that we're providing a certain foundation for all future knowledge. So even if it's very probable that we're awake right now, the fact that it's possible that this could be a dream, just a boring dream, makes it such that we cannot trust the senses. Or we ought not, we shouldn't trust the senses. So Descartes does consider some objections to this view, and those occur most, mostly at sections 6, 7, and 8. So he says, suppose we are dreaming, it seems that dreams must resemble something real. So here is where he draws out the painting analogy. So in this analogy, the thought is, just as paintings reflect some sort of things in the world, so too dreams must reflect some sort of things in the world. So we still have reason to believe that there's something in the world, right? So in the case of paintings, even if it's totally, you know, fantastic, sort of representations, the colors at least will be the same, right? Like, it's not like you can use totally new colors that have never existed anywhere else on a painting, right? It's still going to sort of be reds or shades of whatever. Um, and also maybe if you have like a, a crazy griffin or a, a satyr or something like that, like these are still just conglomerations of things that exist in the real world. So in the same way, even if we're confused whether or not we're dreaming or awake, it seems like these dreams are still composed, in some sense, of real things. So we still know there's something real. And some examples that Descartes provides in section 7, for example, are extension, number, and place. So I'll talk about extension and then just sort of move on. So extension is the idea that things are extended in space. So you might just say in a simple way, things are 3D. Um, and it seems like even if we're com even if we're confused about every other, maybe 4D, 4D if you consider time, um, even if we're confused about every detail, about the color of things and any other sort of facts about it, it seems like it's still going to be in space. That's just kind of a conceptual feature of what it is to be an object. It's a thing extended in space. Um, so that's one of those brute sort of facts about reality that we can't doubt even if we're dreaming. So another point that he raises in section 8 is that we may doubt the sciences and by sciences we mean just sort of empirical things, you know, we might be confused about hands or about trees or something like that, but this doesn't have any bearing on conceptual or mathematical sorts of facts. So even in a dream, you can't dream that a square has three sides or something like that, right? Like, like if it's a square, it's going to have four sides, and that's just a fact irrespective of whether or not we're dreaming or not. Certainly you could think, to pick a different example, that 2 plus 3 equals 4, but 
you'd just be mistaken, right? That's not these sorts of mathematical conceptual facts, matters of reason, don't depend on the senses in this sort of way. So at this point, we have good reason to doubt the senses, but there's just certain sorts of things that remain. So we're not all the way down to demolishing everything we might believe in. We still have reason to believe in a couple things like extension, number, place, and, and mathematical and conceptual truths. So the job is not complete. So to make the job complete, Descartes invokes what will be called the evil demon or evil genius. And this isn't well organized. This, this sort of argument occurs between um, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and it's sort of interspersed with some other thoughts. But I distill it a little bit more. Here's, here's a, just a good sort of example of what he's after. So how then do I know that he, as in God or some other sort of being, has not arranged that there should be neither earth nor sky nor any extended thing nor figure nor magnitude nor place, providing at the same time, however, for the rise in me of the perceptions of all these objects and the persuasion that these do not exist otherwise than as I perceive them. And further, as, sometime, as I sometimes think that others are in error respecting matters of which they believe themselves to possess perfect knowledge, how do I know that I am not also deceived each time I add together two and three, or number the sides of a square? So it seems that the crazy example is that there could be some being an evil demon, right, because Descartes doesn't want to pin this on God because God's a good guy, um, some evil version of a powerful deity that could deceive us even in these most fundamental ways. Even every time I tried to add two and three or think about a square, he could just zap my brain or whatever and make me think that, you know, two plus three equals four. And that would just happen consistently. So, that's the general idea. And uh, here's the argument a little bit more formally laid out. So, it is possible that I am in error about every belief, belief, both regarding reason and the senses. If it is possible that I am wrong, I should remain in doubt. I should remain skeptical. Therefore, I should remain skeptical. So once again, I made it modus ponens, just super easy, valid form. Um, so I think the biggest question that we've already kind of justified this one, right? This is just sort of the principle that he's been using this whole time, that the standard of certainty. Um, so this first premise seems a little bit strange, I think. It is. it is possible that I am in error about every possible belief, both regarding reason and the senses. So, what does this mean? It doesn't seem like I could really be wrong that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Well, that's what the, just the sort of device of the evil genius or evil demon is supposed to do. It seems possible, so it could be the case. It's just at least minimally possible that there's such an evil demon, right? And if it's even possible, then we have some small reason to doubt both reason and the senses. And all he needs, all Descartes needs to show is that it's just even minimally conceivable that there is an evil demon out there and that he's manipulating our thoughts. Every time we say a bachelor is an unmarried man, we somehow get confused and we say something that's false. And if this remote possibility exists, we're deprived of certainty. And if we're deprived of certainty, then we should remain skeptical. So it's the same sort of structure as the other ones. The evil demon is just a colorful way to remind us. I had a professor that once talked about the evil demon as a sort of um, mnemonic device, right? It's just sort of a system of reminding us 
when we're going through and we're thinking we can believe things, when, De when Descartes is writing out his meditations and claiming all sorts of things about the world, he can think back and just think to himself, could this possibly be something that I could doubt? And it seems like it's possible to doubt just about everything you know, because it's conceivable that this demon is doing this thing to our minds or whatever, and that results in some sort of mistake. So the important point here that I'll emphasize, Descartes is not committed to the actuality of evil demon. So a lot of people will sort of straw man this and object to this argument and say, yeah, but there's no evil demon, like that's stupid. And not even Descartes genuinely believes that there is such a demon constantly doing these sorts of fantastical things to us. The only point is that mere possibility is sufficient. If it's even remotely possible, then that's enough to deprive us of certainty. And I know I keep saying that, but that's a central point. So there's the three arguments that lead to the sort of skepticism um, that becomes known as radical skepticism. And this is a term that you should also be familiar with, right? And what makes it so radical is that um, it's, a com it's complete doubt regarding both reason and the senses. So it's not some sort of moderate, like, oh, I'll believe some things and other things need to be proven later. It's like, I doubt everything. Everything that you could think of to doubt, Descartes is willing to doubt it at this point. Um, so next time we'll pick up and we'll continue with the meditations, but between then and now, I'll go over Blackburn's rendition of this. I'll do that more briefly, but it's good supplementary material because I know this reading can be a bit dense. Always ask me questions if you have any. Um, that's what I'm here for. All right. Thank you for listening.